So the first speaker is Gunther Janssen. He's the global head of personalized healthcare analytics at Roche. And he will talk to us about applying advanced analytics for, uh, yeah, for personalized care. So welcome. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Good morning. I can hardly believe it, two years of what feels like continuous screen time, and here we are in a live event. It's really fantastic to be here, and it's great to see so many of you here. I really look forward to getting to know many of you. Today, I would like to talk about applying AI to healthcare. As some of you might say already, it's the final frontier of digitization. If we look back, actually, at the last decades or so, there's been a lot of advances in healthcare, a lot of medical breakthroughs, but hiding behind the fact that there are more and more people that live long and healthy lives, there still are a lot of unmet medical needs. And if we take a more global perspective, it is also true that the population is still growing worldwide and that more and more people are actually becoming older and older, which means that the incidence of chronic diseases, especially difficult to treat chronic diseases, is on the in, in the increase. However, we also live and stand here at a very interesting maybe even pivotal moment in time, where more and more data is becoming available, and we have modern techniques to analyze that becoming available increasingly. When I say more data in the context of healthcare, that means deep, patient-level, high-resolution data that's becoming almost the norm in any clinical trial, and hopefully in the future, also in clinical care. Things like multi-omics data, spatial transcriptomics, metabolomics, and other kinds of approaches that really allows us to look at individual patients at a resolution at a scale that's never been seen before. On the other hand, next to the deep data, we also see increasingly broad data. Typically for a drug development company or a diagnostics company, you would have your clinical trials, which means you look at a very specific subset of the total population that eventually is going to benefit from those solutions. Today, increasingly, we have access or collecting more and more data in routine clinical care that's allowing us to look more longitudinal, which means to really follow patients over a long period of time, and to also collect data about all these other aspects that actually play a role when in terms of determining the outcome of a treatment or a treatment pathway for a patient. And that really brings us to the vision that we have at the company Roche about how we are going to apply AI. We believe that, first of all, any kind of analytics method needs to actually take into account a fit-for-purpose kind of approach to the right scientific question with the right methods. So it's not AI for the sake of AI. And that we apply these kind of methods to the highest quality data. I cannot emphasize that enough, especially in the healthcare sector, how important it is to really start with the highest quality data. We believe that this then starts generating insights in a cycle that brings these insights from the bench to the bedside, but also back again. That's what really an important aspect here. And we think that these kind of insights, they actually can help us across the drug development and diagnostics life cycle. For example, helps us accelerate the discovery of novel compounds and optimize the design of clinical trials, which together then actually ensure that we can bring these treatments to patients much faster than ever before. And we urgently need that. On the other hand, we want to look more and more into this holistic patient journey not just defining disease as a few diagnostic pieces that we are trying to address, but to really look at the patient journey as a whole. Given the data that's becoming increasingly available from also routine clinical care, this allows us to better understand the gaps in care and to address them with integrated healthcare solutions that go beyond simple molecules, although simple is not the right word, but go beyond in a more holistic way to really address the patient's needs where they are the greatest. Finally, we know that we can use these insights as well to improve access, to accelerate the development of diagnostics, and to go in the direction of proper clinical decision support software systems, which means systems that have been designed to assist physicians in making decisions very efficaciously and very quickly to bring the right truck and the right solution to the right patient at the right time. Today, I would like to hone in on one specific aspect that really plays a big role and an increasing role given the data. That's multimodal data. That means data that's not clinical in nature per se, but actually has many different types of data behind it. Think digital pathology, CT scans, x-rays, genomic testing data, genetic testing data, and so forth. 
And if you think a little bit about how a physician comes to a diagnosis, for example, in a very simplified example, if a patient comes in with a certain family history, perhaps history of smoking, uh, typically then some diagnostics are ordered and based on these different pieces of information, a diagnosis is constructed. This is done in clinical practice as long as there is clinical practice. But this integration of these different types of data, these different pieces of the puzzle, if you want, happens in a relatively informal way. It happens in the human brain to some extent. With the onset of these data types becoming increasingly available at scale and at high quality, one can ask the question, can we actually emulate and maybe even improve, at least accelerate this process of integrating these different data types in a way that makes it scalable and faster and that enables these decisions to be faster? This is becoming more and more relevant as also the amount of data, the sheer volume of data with increasing technologies, high resolution approaches, is going to grow at such a rate and at such a pace that it's going to be really difficult for any given individual to fully integrate and fully understand all of this data. So there really is a need for intelligent systems to address um, that problem. But we can go even further than this as an R&D organization, and that's secondary multimodal data. And here the example I like using is, for example, thinking about an X-ray or a CT scan. These kind of approaches are used for clinical diagnostics or in clinical trials to, for example, study how the tumor is growing or is decreasing in growth. However, at the moment, such a comprehensive, high-resolution picture is taken, for example, or a genetic test is performed, we actually collect a lot more data about that individual. Potential entry points or data points that can help us individualizing the approach by digging deeper into the different levels of biological organization. However, this comes with challenges. Obviously, because the data wasn't collected for that purpose itself, it was not part of the study for that purpose. That means integration comes with challenges. Noisy, incompleteness, lack of standardization. These are real challenges that actually come back to this quality of data conundrum. How do we actually ensure that we get a meaningful signal out of these different data types? What I would like to do is present you a very high level, very short case study about multimodal patient representation proof of concept that we've done in cancer, in lung cancer, to be efficient. And this is called patient representation. So here the idea is, imagine that you had these different data types. So in this example, and it's not a hypothetical one, so this is from an actual uh, clinical trial, we have clinical data, longitudinal clinical data, we have lab values, we know something about the demographics of the patient, and then there's some of the more high-dimensional data types available, for example, genomic testing, RNA sequencing, and some types of imaging, like digital pathology. How do you integrate the signal with the idea, can we combine these in a meaningful way to have an information gain compared to analyzing each of these data types alone? We chose for a two-step approach in which we first optimize the representation of each of these different data types into one dimension, which simplifies the representation for computational reasons as well into a flattened, simplified factorial representation. And that, in turn, is then used in a second step for optimized learning for the actual task at hand. And without going into too much detail, um, laboratory values are a very interesting data type because they carry many levels of organization. In the real world, the sheer absence or presence of a lab test already carries a lot of information about that patient. But you can also look at things like normalized values, maximum, minimum, deviations, and so on. The two approaches we've chosen here have been the Siamese net approach, as well as temporal convolutional network. And our approach here has been that depending on the task we're trying to accomplish here, because we're applying these methods for different types of use cases, that we have a flexible pipeline that allows you to play with the different architectures, but that's optimized for the specific task you're trying to do. For RNA sequencing data, it's similar. You could do extremely complicated models, and I'm sure we'll hear more about these as well in the rest of the conference. But here, actually, we already saw that something as simple as a principal component analysis really allows us to reduce the dimensionality without sacrificing too much of the actual signal. Then finally, for the images, this is, of course, where a lot of the computational power comes in. We combined a relatively typical by now a bootstrap your own latent approach, followed by a ResNet architecture that really captures similarity at the tissue level, divides the large digital pathology slides into smaller tiles, sorts them, and then uses that for learning whatever the task is that comes downstream. And then for demographics and treatment, finally, we just used embeddings or the variable itself. So the idea is that we use an approach that optimizes a representation for each of these data types, therefore capturing the variation, 
but singly for each of these modalities into a simplified representation, and only then we start combinatorial learning afterwards in a second step, in a random survival forest in this case, where the use, use case is predicting overall survival, which is a typical thing um, that we do. Obviously, you can do a lot of other things. So it's a flexible pipeline that allows you to investigate how much information content do I see in each of the modalities, and can I meaningfully combine and integrate these signals to predict an ultimate task? And of course, the first question is, in which use cases do you expect that to outperform more traditional single modality methods? Um, here's one example, we have many more, where we did that for one particular clinical trial where we asked the question, what is the gain in C-index performance of this multimodal representation approach for overall survival learning? And as you can see in this example, we have many examples of trials where this works, where there's a lot of information gain actually, where the C-index is increasing when you add additional modalities. So you could see that as a way of gained information to reduce the variation and improve the performance of the eventual model. Obviously, we'll have examples as well where this is not the case, where the addition of additional modalities will come at a cost, but not a gain in information. And the pipeline actually allows us to really ask the question, what is the expected gain in information, for example, or if we already have the data type, how does that influence the performance of the model? You can then use that, for example, in a more clinical paradigm to identify risk groups, and we had some nice examples where we can get some very clean-cut um, percentiles. So why do we do this? It's a proof of concept, it's the first step that allows us to use machine learning for actual clinical problems. A lot of it goes into clinical research, enabling us to more quickly identify patients that are fit for a clinical trial, evaluating the re relevance and even develop novel clinical endpoints that are really important um, to make sure that our medicines reach the right patient groups, um, but also actually can help us better understand what's happening inside a trial by, for example, um, identifying biomarkers or better understand response. More on a visionary statement is that we hope that this will also be approaches that will then slowly get its entry into clinical practice, where they can help us make deeper and individualized treatment decisions. Um, for example, also help us for deep similarity matching, which can be used as an external control, for example, and overall to improve standard of care in oncology. Of course, this is only one example. We're doing many approaches in the general field of AI that sort of resonate with this overall vision. A couple of other examples that we recently worked on is hybrid control arms with and without multimodal representation. We're also exploring knowledge graphs, for example, to really capture the linkedness in biological systems. And then we have some uh, quite many uh, approaches in like matching and recruitment. But we're also increasingly going into the direction of using these insights for clinical practice and for access, where we look at, for example, prognostic and predictive models that can be translated in, into integrated healthcare solutions, and overall to find ways to come to more informed clinical decisions. <clears throat> of course, it's really important here to point out as well that none of these approaches will be the work of one single person, and I think that's really something that I personally really find important. Any of these projects really requires differential expertise, expertise that ranges from computer science and machine learning and software engineering to genetics and mechanistic engineering. All of these are necessary components to bring together. And based on that realization, at Roche, inside the company, we've created an informal network called the Roche Advanced Analytics Network, which currently has more than 1,400 members. And the members come together in a self-organized way to exchange knowledge, to have seminars together, but also to actually address together in a collaborative and voluntary fashion any kind of business problems that come along. Um, this year, actually, we had a, a nice event at the beginning of the year um, called the RAN Festival, where many of those members of, of the RAN actually got a chance to present their work, to connect in a, in a sort of a hybrid online-offline fashion. And I'm quite happy to say that some of those RAN members are actually here today. And some of them will also be at our booth. So if you want to know more about the network, what it's like uh, to work in such a company in this kind of networked approach, feel free to visit our booth. Also like to point out that we're organizing a um, co-organizing a track this year um, that I think has some very exciting speakers. Um, I also want to point out that my colleague Elif um, is going to give a talk as well on the more NLP uh, direction of things. That's all I wanted to say right now. Um, I think we're in time. Um, so thank you very much to, first of all, all of the clinicians involved and the patients and their families involved in the clinical trials and, of course, the contributors from the different teams at Rush. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have online, offline, as you wish. Thank you. <laughs>